Welcome to the Leadership Purpose with Robin podcast. I'm your host, Robin L. Owens, PhD. And this is where we dive in each week to give advice, tools, and tips for high achieving women leaders. And we talk about leadership purpose and its importance for you. I am a college professor, and when I am not doing that, I am speaking, writing, coaching, mentoring, and teaching high achieving women leaders how to find and not only find, but how to stay in alignment with their leadership purpose so they can make a meaningful difference right there in their career, leadership, or business. Okay, let's dive in. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Leadership Purpose with Dr. Robin podcast. I'm so glad you're here and so glad you take time out of your schedule and your day and everything you're doing and all the things you can be doing to listen into the podcast. So thanks for being here. And today we will be talking with Kim Perkins, PhD. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Kim. Kim is a former journalist and pro athlete. She holds a PhD in positive organizational psychology, and she works on purpose, culture, and communication with leaders at cutting edge of science, tech, and entertainment companies. Her first book, Winner Take All, expected out next year, 2022, explores the role competition plays in our life. Welcome, Dr. Kim Perkins. Hi, so delighted to be here. So glad you're here and I can't wait to hear all about (laughs) It's an interesting topic to me that we don't hear about much. But before we get into all of that, let's just tell now we heard a little bit from your brief bio, but tell people a little bit more about you and then we'll talk about your work. Great. Well, you know, the psychology uh, is my third career. So I started off as a writer and I wrote for newspapers and magazines and I became a magazine editor back when we had magazines. And, um, and then I took that little time off to, to pursue a hobby that turned into a career, which was that it turned out that I uh, had a talent for speed skating. And so I, um, in my 30s, became a professional speed skater. Wow. And I raced all over the world and taught, started teaching, coaching people and teaching classes. And that's how I really got into the work I do now, because I thought, hmm, you know, athletic careers don't last forever. I bet that people use stuff like this in organizations because, you know, I'd already been working in organizations at that point in time. And so that kind of directed me toward thinking about motivation and the way groups work together and um, how people, you know, respond off of each other and how the leaders work with the group from from doing speed skating, which is a very, it's both a team and an individual sport, really. And that led me to my current work that where I've worked in leader development and as an executive coach and uh, and speaker and, and, and now author and editor. Yeah. Wow. That's an amazing journey. And speed skating, I mean, that's not something that you hear about every day. So that must have been a very interesting experience for you. Yes, it was, especially because I was kind of a geeky kid and didn't know that I had any athletic talent until I got much older. So so I kind of look at things from both the perspective of, you know, kind of the jock perspective, but also the total non-jock perspective. And I think that's something that I bring to my work. Yeah. Yeah. How did you stumble across that? Well, honestly, I had taken a um, an editorial job in a place I'd never lived before. I was I had this great job, and it was in South Carolina. And I was kind of a city girl; I didn't really know what to do with myself in this like resort area. And I had a friend who said, "I'm going to run in this 5K race. Why don't you train with me, and we'll run?" And so, like, I did that, and it was like the hardest thing I ever did, just running. And I got there on the day, and it was beautiful, a beautiful place, and all these people who were cheering for me on the sidelines instead of like laughing at me like they had in high school. And I thought racing is wonderful. I just hate running. I wonder if they do this on skates. And sure enough, they did. And so the speed skating I did was primarily on rollerblades. So it's a small sport in the U.S., but it's very big internationally. And so I got to compete internationally at at, uh, speed skating on rollerblades. (laughs) I love that. I love that you took something that you enjoyed and just made a a slight tweak to it and then found something that you really enjoy. Yeah. 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 I love that because we can use that lesson 
for any area of our life, right? There's something about it that works. Yes. Just add on the piece that really suits us best. So that's a wonderful lesson. All right. So now tell us a little bit more about your work. We heard a little bit about the book, but tell us about a little more in uh, depth, the kind of work you do. Yeah. So I, my, a lot of my interest has been working with team communication because that is such a big determinant of how good a time we're going to have at work. So psychological safety, the idea of making sure that people feel like they are able to speak up and able to be heard about what's really going on as opposed to pretending about it. And, and that's where it kind of intersected with what I had learned about competitiveness as, a, as a, an athlete was that a lot of times I noticed that when team communication wasn't good, it was because the leader of the team was really focused on sort of an, shall we say, an interpersonal outcome. Like, well, you know, a lot of times teams leaders have to deal with a lot of politics and they'll sometimes get focused on making sure that it's me and not that other person who is in line for the next promotion, for example. Um, and when that happens, that often means that there's there's such a personal stake in it for the leader that the team doesn't want to talk to them about what's really going on or doesn't want to bring them any bad news or uh, starts tiptoeing around them. And so I, I noticed that, you know, we often talk about competitiveness as a great thing, but my book is called Winner Take None because it's not really working for our dynamics that we have in most companies these days. Mm. And and speaking of so many women entrepreneurs I know have often left organizations because of the politics and because of the competitiveness, because they've wanted to live a more purpose-filled, authenticity-based life than all of that. So the premise of your book basically says what about competition? Well, it says that it can be really fun, but that it's only a very small amount of the time is it actually appropriate at work. What I'm trying to do is think about as, as we move into the future and our companies get more uh, flat hierarchies, more dispersed leadership, then there's less of a ladder to climb. There's fewer positions that are hierarchical. It doesn't really make sense for all of our business language to be about competitive terms and winning and all the war metaphors. And, but it's so baked into our culture that we don't even notice. And yet it's, it's a big turnoff for a lot of people, not just women. And, and so I want people to have that conversation. You know, I tried to study this for my dissertation at Claremont. I did my master's thesis on competitiveness and flow. And when I tried to put it into a work environment for my dissertation, it all fell apart. All, I would try to interview people I knew, women I knew who were very competitive and they would, I would know them to be competitive because I'd competed with them in places where that was appropriate. And they would say, oh, no, 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 I'm not competitive. I just try to do the best I can every day. And I'd be like, mm, that doesn't smell right to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've kind of come to think of competitiveness and perfectionism as kind of the same way and that it's a little bit rewarded in our culture. So we go with it, but it actually has more negative effects on us and the people around us than it would seem. Yes, that makes sense. That makes sense. And so tell us, it sounds like that probably frames the work you do with leaders and others. So tell us what you enjoy most about the work. Like when you're in it, what really lights you up? You know, I think of myself as kind of a translator. So, you know, a lot of times coaches will be very firmly on like sort of the emotional or storytelling side of things and other coaches will be more like, you know, data and studies show. And, and, and I feel like I'm kind of a bridge between those two sides where I'm really interested in our own internal experiences and the stories we tell ourselves. And at the same time, here are some things that on average, seem to work for people. Here are the bigger patterns. And I feel like I, what I love to do is translate between those two sides. Ah, uh, so you're a translator. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you don't have to, but do you happen to have a specific example of a time when you were in the moment and you saw the translation happen and you were oh, appreciating yeah. that moment? Yes, I do a lot of work with tech companies and, it, you know, with tech companies and in, in tech fields, they're often very data driven. And so when uh, I'm thinking specifically about last year or not last year, it's the pandemic. Who knows what year it is? Exactly. 
<laughs> the year before the pandemic. Or when even was, what day it is for that oh, matter. But truly, anyway. We're all off our game. But I I was the keynote speaker at the Atlassian conference overseas. So and um this is a huge software company. And so what and I was talking about how people change, what actually makes human beings tick, and it's not a logical argument, <laughs> which is of course what most of the tech people were, are, well, that's what makes sense for them, you know? And so uh, there was a moment when I kind of gotten all of the ducks lined up in a row for them to get the perfect illogic, but perfect psychological logic of how people go ahead and make changes in organizations. And I could just feel this light bulb go off, you know, <laughs> uh, and it was so great. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a wonderful moment when you you see people get it. When you see, yes, isn't that something that every teacher or professorial part person wants? Is that's that's what we those are the moments we look for. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. It sounds like you know, even through your you said your second or third career, and through your background as an athlete, and now the work you're doing, you amassed a great amount of experience and expertise, probably across the board. So given every, everything you experienced, what can you share with our listener? And by the way, I think of um, the listener, well, I created the podcast for what I call high achieving women, yes. women who have goals, who are ambitious and are professional and just broadly thinking about high achieving women. And, and I noticed that women that fall in that category tend to be the ones who are supporting others yes. and rarely the ones who are receiving support. So I created this podcast just to share from folks like you and other people from your experience just to be, hey, this is a place where I can get some support from a variety of experiences and backgrounds. And so given your your uh, rich experience, what's um, one word of advice or some helpful hint you could just give to the woman I just described? You know, I'm going to talk about competitiveness again, because we never really talk about that. And that's part of why I'm attracted to that topic. Yes. Um, And a lot of us still, you know, I'm, I'm an older person and a lot of us were very much trained that we, um, that competitiveness is, is what we have to do to survive. Yes. And yet we don't really want to talk about this because it's so incompatible with the feminine role. And so I found for a lot of women that creates kind of this uh, push pull within them where they find themselves being, being or acting or feeling competitive toward other women, even though they know that that's not the right path. So if you find yourself in that, I found I have a little exercise that I found is really useful for getting yourself out of that mindset. And so usually competitive rivalries arise because of similarities. You you tend to feel competitive with people who you notice are similar to you in some way, you know, like the the person, I'll I'll give a sports analogy really quick. Like the, the, you know, the top team doesn't feel competitive with the 10th team, you know, (laughs) <laughs> but if the teams are from the same geographic place or from the, or like third and fourth, they're like tied for, that's when the rivalries really arise. And so when we're feeling like that uncomfortable competitiveness where we are tracking that person really hard or we're, we're, we find ourselves not being nice to that person or, you know, otherwise that they're taking up more psychic energy than they need to. What I found is useful is to think about what are the differences between you and them? So I'll give you an example from my own life. There was a woman in, you know, and I I don't think I'm over my competitiveness, but I think I've seen a a new way of doing it too. Mm. Um, There's a woman in grad school, you know, I I, I took a lot of pride in my athletic uh, track record. And there's a woman in grad that I knew in grad school who uh, was also had been out in the world doing things and was also an elite athlete and was also about my height. And I used to have this thing of like, oh, well, if she's doing X, then I have to do Y and I have to do it better than she does in order to like be seen. And I realized that this was going on. And then so what I did was I, I went to, uh, went to, got my journal out and went to a little safe space. And I just wrote down off the top of my things, 10 things that were different between her and me. Oh. So that I wouldn't feel like she was taking my spot or in danger of taking my spot as an, you know, in in terms of identity and like who I am and what I bring to the people around me. And I realized, and by the end of doing that, I realized that we were not competing. We were not 
but we were, we did have enough in common that we could probably help each other. (laughs) (laughs) We could probably understand each other. And so since it was all coming from me and not coming from her, as far as I can tell, I don't know how she felt about me. And it's frankly not my business, but this was a way that I found I could take back my ability to think and not focus on her as opposed to focusing on her when I should be focusing on me. Yes, that's a wonderful tool to use to look at the differences to kind of step away from that notion of competition. And what a wonderful experience that you had. And you realize, hey, we could probably support each other in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's what ended up happening. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful tool for for our listeners to have. Now, as you know, uh, this podcast is about and my work is about leadership purpose. So when you hear the term leadership purpose, what comes to your mind? Oh, goodness. You know, everybody thinks that leadership or not everybody, but a lot of people think that leadership is a set of skills skills, and it's so intensely personal. It's really driven by what you want to see in the world and not what the, the classic, shall I say, male oriented model of, you know, acquiring money and power. And so when I think about leadership purpose, I really think about the why we're doing and what change we want to see as a result of our leadership. So many women I find feel more called to leadership, like this thing has to get done and somebody's got to do it. And it's not like I really want to do it, but somebody's got to do it. And I guess it's going to have to be me. And that's so valid. And I think that that is, wakes for a lot more alignment than hmm, where can I put myself in the, in the going hierarchy of things. You know? Yes. Yes. So with your work and experience with um, leaders, do you think leadership purpose is important? And if so, why? Or why? Oh, it's so important. It's so critical because I've, I've run into, I've worked with so many women leaders, and I'm sure you have too, where they're really good at hitting all the marks and they can, you know, put out, put out the flaming hoop of fire and they'll jump through it, you know? And then finally somebody says, okay, you're really good. Let's put you in charge of something. What do you want to do? Do whatever you want to do. And they go, uh, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I would ever want to do and have trouble defining their own hoops, you know? I experienced this just in grad school when when we're done with classwork (laughs) and suddenly we get to do whatever we want to do. And uh uh-oh. And if you don't have a purpose in your leadership at that point, you will start to flounder. And that's where you have to really start bringing one in. And if you can get ahead of the game and know why you're doing what you're doing before you have free reign to lead a bunch of people or command a bunch of resources, then even better. Yes. Yes. And of course, I resonate with that. You know, I resonate with what you're saying, the importance of having that kind of guidance in direction. Yeah. 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 And it comes it comes from within us. There's no, you know, there's no faking it or adopting what the, you know, five year goals for the company are. Well, everybody seems to be trying to scale in this way. So I guess I'll do that. But that's not going to, in my opinion, that's not going to get you through. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this has been so helpful. Now the time has gone by so fast, but we're coming to the end of our episode. But is there anything else maybe that you didn't get a chance to say that you might just want to share with our listeners right now from oh, anyone? Robin, I could thought? I could talk with you all day, Dr. Robin. <laughs> <laughs> but if you would like to find out more about my book, which will be out next uh next year in 2022, the it's winner take none.com. And that's where you can get updates and, um, and pre Okay, great. Winnertakenone.com. And uh, if we want to reach you otherwise, is that the best place or are you? That's a good place. I'm also kimperkins.com. You can find me occasionally on Twitter at imperative form. Okay, that sounds great. And now tell us your website one more time for the people who are in motion. <laughs> yes, kimperkins.com. Kim, kimperkins.com. All right, yes. that's great. You know, this has been a very interesting conversation. I'm so grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule and all that you're doing to share with us today. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin. And if you want to hear more about me, you can reach me on my website, robinlowens.com, robinlowens.com, or you can find me on social media, Robin L. Owens, PhD, Robin L. Owens, PhD. And before we leave for today, I want to give a shout out to Linda Stevenson, the greatest podcast manager in the world. (laughs) She's the one that helps keep us going. And if you want to reach her about your podcast, you can find her at Linda Stevenson, podcast manager 
on LinkedIn, and she is the owner of LJS Creative Services. So thank you, Linda, for keeping us going. We appreciate you. All right, everyone. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Leadership Purpose with Robin podcast. If you enjoyed it, head on over and rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode. New episodes drop every week and I can't wait to hang out with you again soon. Meanwhile, this is Robin signing off. See you next time.